Hello, everyone. My name is Brett Cannon. I'm one of the core developers on Python. Uh, so this talk's going to be about how, literally, how Python, uh, how import works, not how Python works. Talk to Larry about that one. Um, so to preface this talk, I'm going to discuss technically how this all works in Python 3.3. Uh, specifically, what happened in 3.3 is uh, import lib, which is a pure Python re-implementation of import, was made the default implementation. So all that C code that used to exist to make import work is mostly gone. There's, it was chopped in over, over half the lines are gone. And now it's all run by pure Python code from the import lib package. Uh, so that means if something's not totally clear, you can actually now easily go read the source code, because it is just all pure Python uh, in Python 3.3. Uh, the other thing is, is while the individual little details will be specific to Python 3.3, the overarching idea of how things work will apply all the way back to Python 2.5. So when I start to dis discuss things like importers and loaders and finders, which if you don't know what I'm talking about, you will hopefully shortly, it will apply to you if you're still stuck on 2.5. Uh, but little specific details are specific to 3.3, and I'll try to point those out. Um, but end to end, uh, it all works. Anyway, uh, and if you want to follow me online, uh, I'm Brett Cannon at Google Plus or at Bretsky on Twitter. So um, way back. Uh, probably late 90s or so when Python was still kind of becoming a language that people knew about. It was often called Lisp without macros. Uh, and one of the reasons is, is pretty much anything you can do with syntax is actually a function call underneath, right? Like under under add is what is called when you do the plus operator. Um, import is no different. Import is actually just syntactic sugar for a function call. And this is literally the mapping. So if you have this from dot dot spam import flying circus, uh, and for those of you that don't know, this is a explicit relative import, uh, which you can get in Python 2.6 if you do from under under future import uh, absolute import. Uh, basically what this means is try to import the spam module uh, two levels above yourself in your current package. But basically this just maps directly to a function call. And it literally is a function call at the bytecode level. So how does it all work? So here's your under under import function that implements import. Uh, what you're trying to get is spam. So if this had been import something something, so like import foo.bar, that would be here. But in the from format, whatever is here, uh, ignoring the dots, gets put here. Uh, the relative import dots, I should say. Uh, the globals of the caller are always passed in, as are the locals. Uh, the, this is called the from list. So in this format, from blank import whatever. So the stuff you're trying to get out of the module in the end, all gets put in this list. And then this is the index. So that's the number of dots that lead. So by default, it's zero. Uh, and then however many dots past that gets set to there. But it's literally just syntax to function call. Nothing fancy. In, in previous versions of Python, there was actually a specific import bytecode. No, that is still there, but literally all the bytecode does is call that function. Okay. So, the, the f so what Larry's alluding to is there's a specific import bytecode, but the bytecode itself does nothing more than basically look in your global scope of where you're at and actually just makes this function call. So it's simpler at the bytecode level, but it, in all honesty, it's literally still just a function call. So what the hell does this function do? Well, so here it is, just as we said from before, the default uh, if you were to call this today, globals is set to none, locals is none, from list is empty, index is zero. Uh, this is a change from Python, actually this is a change in Python 3.3. It was a mistake that actually got left to negative one uh, up until that point. All of Python 3 should have been zero. Uh, I'll just take responsibility, uh, why not? Uh, but now it's zero is the, the way it should be. So the first thing you start out caring about is the index. Is this a relative import or an absolute import? In other words, do you know exactly the name of what you want, or do you have to figure out what you're after? Right? So this is the first step you've got to make, just make a decision on. With that decided, what you then do is you try to calculate exactly what the absolute name is. Now, some conventions I should mention. Any box in red means I kind of cheated and left out a couple steps that are kind of obvious to explain, but you wouldn't directly implement this in source code. Uh, a red arrow means I skipped a step that's not critical for this discussion, but if you actually implemented import, you'd actually want to do. So in this case, I didn't specify how you get package, 
but by default, what it is is it's under under package as an attribute in your global namespace because that'll be set on the module you're calling from, and you use that to get that. If it's missing, what you can just do is take under under name, and if under under path is defined, that's package, and if it's not, you just chop off the end because that means you're in a submodule. Uh, but basically, what you do is you, you slice off one level because, as I said, levels the number of dots. So if you have one dot, it means your current location in a package. If it's two dots, you want to go one level up, like in directories on Unix. Three dots means two levels up, et cetera. And you want to split. And basically, that's kind of the position of your parent where you want to end up, right? So if you end up with zero, you're right in the package where you want to be. If, it's, uh, one if you want to go one up, you want to strip off. So like foo.bar.baz. You want to knock one off, you just want foo.bar. Um, and then you just split it up. And then what happens is, is that's how you get your base, right? You take the farce left part of this uh, right side split, and then you check if you had name defined. Because you, what you can do is if you do from dot dot or from dot import something, name is an empty list. So what happens if name is actually defined? Well, you need to concatenate together with a dot so you get a complete name. So foo.bar dot WYSIWYG, whatever you want. But basically now you have your full name of exactly what you're after. And if you don't define name, then you already said, all right, if you're just from dot, it means you want something from your, your parent, right? Your package, where, you, where you're at. So your base name, what we just got from here, is exactly what you're after. So this is how you calculate the full name of what you're trying to import when you use relative imports. Now, obviously, if you actually specified it completely and your index is zero, there's absolutely zero calculation. But this is how you calculate the name of what you're after, OK? So with that figured out, you do a quick lock. Now in Python 3.3, uh, the import lock is per module. Uh, before that, it was overall the entire uh, process. Uh, so that you don't get deadlocks anymore when you do imports with threads and stuff. They used to get really complicated. So this is a nice feature. It's obviously a little more complicated, which is why it's a red box. But basically, it's per module now. So what does this mean? Well, you first check if full name is in sys.modules, basically, is it cached or not? All right, let's say that it's not, the complicated case, because if it's cached, you just return it. All right, so first you gotta check, is there a dot in the name of what you're trying to import? If there is, what you need to do is you need to look for the parent in sys.modules. Uh, this is when you try to, this is what will trigger an error if you try to import foo.bar and you have it already imported foo. That's kind of a problem. So this is just trying to pull in the parent. Because what ends up happening is, as you know, any package will define under under path. And that needs to be where you search for anything in that, in that package, right? You're not searching off sys.path. You're searching off the specific section of the directories or where you want to look in your package for any submodule. Now, if there is no dot, right, like anything from the standard library at the top level or anything you might define that's not in a package, there is no path. So path gets set to none, right? So this is specifying how to find out where you want to look for stuff, whether it's nowhere specific or somewhere very specific because you're in a package. All right, so with all that done, what you now need to do is you need to iterate through sys.metapath, all right? Um, this was all introduced in Python 2.5 through PEP 3.02. And what's in sys.metapath are things called finders. And basically what finders' jobs are to do are to find loaders. And I'll explain what a loader is later. But basically, a finder defines, uh, and we'll call these um, metapath finders. Uh, I'll clarify later why, but just consider these metapath finders because they're off sys.metapath. So a metapath finder defines find module, right? And what you're looking for is the name of what you want and where to look for it. Remember, this is either none if it's top level or under under path if you're looking within a package. And what you try to do is find a loader, right? So let's say you get none back, right? So well, that means you didn't find anything. So you keep looping through here until you find a, a metapath finder that has a loader somehow. Now, this is red because if you don't find anything, this is when you get your import error, right? You couldn't find a metapath finder that could say, all right, I know how to load this. I know how to get you what you want. Here's an object that can get you what you want. If this loops through and fails and can't find anything, then you get your import error and Pathos goes, I don't know. I give up. Now, 
if loader is not none and it's an actual object, then what you do is you call load module on loader, right? So all you're doing is passing in full name and just saying, okay, loader, your finder said you know how to find this and load it for me. So here's what I want. Load it for me, give me the module. Uh, this isn't a red box because technically you're supposed to pull from stop modules, but it's a stupid little backwards compatibility detail. Okay, so we have a finder. We asked our Metapath finders, find me a loader to load this object, load this module. We found one, so we said, okay, load it for me, get, it, get me the object. It did. Um, it will set sys.modules for you and a bunch of other little details like setting under under file and under under name and all that other stuff. So this basically puts it in sys.module, so now it's cached. And now what you need to do is check if you were importing something in a package or not, right? So if you were, you need to set it on the parent. In order, so like if you do import foo.bar, you gotta make sure bar gets set as an attribute on foo, because otherwise if you go foo.bar, it's just gonna fail because it won't know what, where bar is. Uh, if it's not though, there's nothing specifically to do. And that's import. Uh, this is what happened in Python 3.3. Everything got refactored such that everything works off of sys.metapath now. Now if you look before, all of this, uh, there was, if you loop through and there's nothing there, there's a whole chunk of C code that you can touch, manipulate, do anything with that kind of just magically did stuff. But as of Python 3.3, that magic's now washed away and is now exposed to you as classes. That you can actually subclass and change and remove and do whatever the heck you want to do with it. Uh, please don't do anything crazy. I don't want the bug reports. Uh, but the point is, is as of Python 3.3, this is literally how import actually finds a module and loads it. It's much simpler than the way it used to be because there used to be all this magic. Any questions before I move forward? Yeah. Parent equals sys.modules. So yep. what if parent is not in sys.modules? Uh, trying to remember exactly the details. Uh, that, there's a reason why there's a red arrow. Uh, okay. I left that detail. You, you have to basically go through the whole process, but to the parent at that point? More or less, yeah. Okay. Uh, I believe that's how it's implemented. It's either that or I don't remember if that's an error or not. There's weird cases where it magically does stuff import does stuff for you and there's other places where it magically doesn't do anything and just says, screw you, you messed up. Uh, I don't remember if it's, it's your problem, fix it, or I'll do my best. But if you say import foo dot bar and foo hasn't been loaded, it's going to hit that spot. And yeah, so yeah, 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 it loops back and tries, it, okay. you're right, it, it actually kind of recursively calls import. Okay. Actually, I remember that is a problem because someone complained that it did it recursively now instead of iteratively, and I said, I don't care, so yeah. <laughs> it works. Uh, so yeah, you're right. You will go back and. Whatever. Anyway, so that's import. Uh, but. Something else. You mentioned that there's now a lot of third modules. Yeah. So if you have a single import, you have a single problem. So Antoine Petru rewrote, rewrote the lock mechanism, and what does what it tries to do is detect a circular import problem if you have multiple threads going at once. So if it detects that there's a circular um, import, it'll just not try to import the module, one of the modules in the circle and just leave it not fully initialized so all the other imports can keep going and then finish their imports later. Uh, if there is no circular import, what happens is it just blocks one of the threads so the other thread can finish and when it's done, the, next, the other thread can continue with its imports. I was asking about the single broad state. Uh, well, that's not really a problem because okay. if you're single threaded, there's, a, you're, there's no lock. Tell us if it's different than Python 2 or? Very different. Well, this is, yeah, for threaded, if, for the threaded case, if you're talking about single threaded, this has nothing to do with that. You still have to structure your stuff differently if you have a circular import. This is purely in a multi-threaded perspective. Okay? Okay. So, let's go into a little more detail, right? Because Obviously, Python gives you a little bit more than just this, or else where the hell do you read source and make bytecode and all this other wonderful stuff? So basically what happens is, is Python being Python, we now give you reasonable defaults, right? So sys.metapath has some classes on there that do things the way you have come to get, be used to them doing. So one of them is what's called Pathfinder, and it's a metapathfinder uh, that does what you 
think would happen for source code. So we'll discuss how this works, right? So we'll discuss how find module works on the MetaPath finder. OK, so remember, this is all just a method call on a finder, uh, MetaPath finder. Uh, defaults to nine uh, for path, and then the full name of what you're after. So there's a little bit of setup. Uh, I'll discuss this later. This is a Python 3.3 edition, but um, namespace path is an empty list. And then you check if path is none. If path is none, uh, you assume you're looking on sys.path, right? Because if you don't specify anything, that's where you're going to look. But if you're in a package, you're only going to look at where the package is. So if you're not told where to look, you just assume sys.path. All right, so now what are we going to do? Well, we have our list of path entries to look for, so we're going to iterate through that list of paths. All right, so with each path entry, we're going to see if it's in sys.path importer cache. What this happens to be is a cache of just regular finders. So not metapath finders like on sys.metapath, but regular finders. I know it's a little confusing. It took us weeks to fix the glossary when we updated this for Python 3.3. Don't feel bad if it's confusing. It took me years to get this straight in my head. Um, but basically what we do is we try to find if there is a regular finder in this cache. If there is, we pull it out and that's what we're going to use. But obviously let's assume worst case, you don't have it. Well, now you got another thing to iterate through. Sys.path hooks, all right? What this is supposed to do is help you find a finder for a path entry. So let's say uh, you take an entry, right? So what you do is you call the hook, which is just a callable with the path entry. If it triggers an import error, you go back up and keep iterating through. So this, instead of returning none, like fi find module as an error, this raises an exception. I did not design that API. Do not blame me. Um, let's say finder x returns something, right? No exception. Well, that then gets cached because we found something, right? Now we have a finder that knows how to work with that path entry for stuff, right? So if you're looking at sys.path, you go, all right, so here's a path on sys.path. You go through here and try to find, all right, can you find things for me on this location? Yes or no, right? And you go, one of these will eventually say, yes, here's a finder that knows how to work with this location on the, uh, on the file system, right? So it could be a zip finder. If you have a zip file on sys.path, it could be something that works with directories, what have you. And then that gets cached. Uh, if nothing is found, uh, none gets set in sys.path imported cache as a representation of don't bother looking again for this. Nothing was found the first time through. Uh, this is a change from Python in Python 3.3 before um, imp.null imported was put here. Uh, I didn't like that. Uh, I figured none was a good sentinel instead of a actual object. Uh, if you need to write backwards compatibility code, uh, all you need to do to clear this cache is to go through and remove anything that's none or a uh, instance of null importer, and it'll work on any version of Python you use. Uh, anyway, so this is how you find a regular finder for a path entry and get in the cache, all right? So, as I said, now we have something in our cache that we can actually use to try to find modules in our location in the path. So finders find modules and meta finders find finders? Yes, meta path finders find finders, finders find loaders. Loaders load modules. Whoa. Everyone get that one? <laughs> Metapath finders find, Metapath finders get you a finder. Finders will find, will get you a loader and a loader will get you a module. Once again, I did not design this. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of actually history before this of people writing up hacks in Python 2 and when they tried to standardize it, they kind of went with what they did and all that and I'm trying to clean all this stuff up, but at least it's object oriented so it's easy to subclass and all that stuff. Anyway, so what do we end up with here? So we've got this stuff cached. Now we need to find a loader, right? We've done all this work. We've got, our we've got a finder. We want a loader. So what happens? Well, we end up calling our finder uh, with a method called find loader. Uh, this is new in Python 3.3. Uh, before, it would have just been called find module. I'll explain why it changed in a second. Um, and it'll return a two item uh, sequence of either of a loader and what we call portions. So basically, uh, what we care about really here is whether or not loader is none. If loader is none, 
uh, is not none, we're done. We found our loader, let's just give it back. You're good to go, right? Uh, if loader is none, which means we did not find you a loader, but we may have found um, places for namespace packages, which if you went to my Python 3.3 talk, you know about, but if you don't, uh, in Python 3.3, when we iterate through your paths, whether it's in a package or off sys.path, uh, if we find, uh, basically, we'll stick with files. If we find directories of the same name, uh, but with no under under init file, we collect them. And those are what portions are. And they get all collected together and we eventually, if we don't find any under under init file in a package or a module with that name, we make a namespace package. And then we just give you a, a module whose under under path is a collection of all those portions. Uh, this is a big deal for really, really big packages like Zope, where you have zope.interfaces and zope.database. Like you might have zope.interface installed in one place on sys.path and then zope.database installed in another place on the sys.path. What this will do is combine them into a single object. So when you search for something in the zope namespace, like database or interface, it'll look in both places without you having to munge them all together into a single zope directory. That make sense? The Linux users will love this because it means the, the distros aren't going to do crazy stuff behind your back anymore. They're just going to stick them all right next to each other and magically it's all going to get woven together. Why would we call portions? Ask Eric Smith. You can name it whatever you want. I mean, it's just a variable. Because what ends up happening if you see down here, portions is just a list of potential directories to look if nothing better is found. And you just end up extending that namespace path uh, list that you saw at the beginning. So that just all gets collected. So, as I said, you keep iterating, uh, trying to find all this stuff for every entry in your path, uh, looking, asking for all these, asking all these finders, do you know how to load this? Do you know how to load this? And subsequently along the way, all right, if you can't load it, do you know of any place, do you know of any portions of a namespace uh, path that I should care about if you don't find anything in the end? So, if all that gets collected in the end and no loader's found, uh, we see if namespace path has anything. If we found something, great. Then what we can do is we can return um, a loader called namespace loader uh, with, the na with the paths and the full name, and this will be what loads a namespace package. But if we find nothing, we've completely failed, found no loader whatsoever, and we return none. So that is how you find a loader. Any questions? I know it's a lot. <laughs> Uh, as I said, import libs all in Python now, so you can read this on your own. There's no crazy C code. Uh, so if you don't like the diagrams or I'm going too fast, feel free to look at the source code. Is it helpful to have that level of, the level of abstraction where meta finders find finders and finders find loaders? Um, you can get away with not having one of those. You might be able to. So basically what happens is Metapath finders will be finders for built-in modules. There's a finder for a Metapath finder for frozen modules. And then we have a Metapath finder for, um, zip. no, zip is a regular finder, and a path finder, because that's off sys.path. Um, so you might use this for like crazy logging stuff. Uh, between Python 2 and Python 3, when we renamed stuff inside our library, we talked about having a Metapath finder that would auto map module names. So we would re rename everything to Python 3 names in Python 2.7, and we were going to then say, if you use the old Python 2 name, we'll actually say, all right, no, that's not actually what you want. Let's import the other thing behind the scenes for you and return that loader, and you just wouldn't see the difference necessarily, except under your name would be the new Python 3 name. Uh, so that's something you can use with um, Meta Pathfinder. So it's one level up. Whether it's useful or not, you could argue yes or no. Uh, it ends up working out rather well in terms of Meta Pathfinder stuff that just deals with at a higher abstraction than individual like directory locations, while stuff like a regular finder does work at a directory location specifically. Anybody else? No? Okay. Actually, what's my time? Oh, perfect. All right, so let's assume all that magic worked, right? Now we have a loader. What the heck is a loader gonna do for us? So if you remember, a loader, we call load module, and this is supposed to give us an actual module object in the end. Well. Why don't we look at this from the perspective of trying to load some source, right? That's the common case, it's what we all know. So let's assume we use the, uh, the Metapath finder, we found Pathfinder. Uh, we went through and we had a finder that knew how to handle um, 
directories and it got us a loader to load from a directory source code, Python source code. Right, so how does that work? No, nope. let's start off with our load module method. Uh, all we have is the name to go off of. So what happens? Well, first thing is we get a new module and we set it in sys.modules. Now, it's a little more complicated than this, uh, but basically the deal is, is if something's already in sys.modules and you ask to load it, because you might be you're going to be asking for a reload uh, implicitly. If it's already in system modules, you got to make sure you pull that out and reuse it. Uh, if not, you need to stick in a new one and you need to stick it on to start immediately because if you start to get imports and imports and imports, they got to be able to pull in the module and have it there for use uh, or else you're going to suddenly get errors saying, I can't import this and you end up in an infinite loop. Uh, so you get your module that you're going to be using. Uh, the next thing is, is you figure out where your source, source path is, right? Uh, loaders can define a get file name uh, method that'll just figure out what the source path is. Typically, the loader knows what, um, in this case, the loader knows what directory it's looking in. So it just knows, okay, well, if I'm looking for a source code, source file, it's with this module name split off at the last dot and just take directory os.path.join and then tack on .py. Uh, next, you need the bytecode path. Um, in the int module, there's a function called cache from source, and it'll take the source path and recalculate it to use the under under pycache uh, stuff in Python 3.3. Three. Three. Is it two? Yeah. It's two or three? Either way. Uh, <laughs> uh, basically, uh, under under pycache is a new thing in Python 3 somewhere or other. Uh, basically, all your .pyc files are now put in a directory. Uh, not next to your .py files, so it's a lot cleaner, and they're all uniquely named per version, per VM, so you don't trample. So if you use Python 3 and Python 4, Python 5, all in the same code, um, you won't have to regenerate your PYC files every time. Anyway, that's what this is. It figures out that directory, that new name for that bytecode. Uh, after that, you call the loader's path stats uh, method, and that gives you some statistics. Uh, such as the size of the source code and the last modification time, because you're gonna need that to know if the bytecode's still good. And then you call the get data method, which basically just reads uh, the path that you give it off of disk and gives you back the bytes. So, uh, so it, it's actually, the, the module's added this, this module before any of the work was done? Yes. I was surprised, I thought it would, I would, thought it would be done at the end to serve the last step. So no, it's but, visible to the outside world while it's in process. Now remember there's a lock on that module, but yes, the deal is, is you have to do it first because if you, um, you'll see when, it'll be clear when you see how loads work on modules, but basically if while you're loading the module, it ex executes something else that ends up leading to trying to import yourself again, or, or it tries to import that module somehow. Well, you, circular import. Exactly, you'll lead to a circular import and you'll you constantly, discover that you're in the okay. yeah. So you just need to return that object and just go, okay, I'm not doing anything with it. So you don't have a problem, and then eventually it'll just finish being populated. But this is where you can get into circular import issues. But if that wasn't there, you'd be looping on yourself forever trying to load it. Okay. Can they use those stats for? So uh, I'll discuss it in literally like the next transition. But basically, the stats are used to figure out whether or not the bytecode's out of date. So next slide, uh, the next section down, I'll make it very, very clear. Anybody else? No. Okay. And this is the answer to, Fecund to Fecundo's question. Uh, so we've got our data, right? Now we've got to figure out, is this bytecode still good? All right? So first, first four bytes, does it match the magic number? Which is basically, you can kind of think as a version number for uh, bytecode. Uh, and also the format of .pyc files. If it matches, fantastic. If it doesn't, forget it. It's cheap to remake .pyc files. We don't care. So it matches, fantastic. Next, is the modification time of the source code the same as what we have recorded in the PYC file? In other words, has the source code changed since we made the, the .pyc file and this we gotta make it again? So you take from the data uh, the next four bytes, so bytes four to eight, and you get the long, uh, the number out of it, and you compare it to the modification time out of your statistics uh, and see is the source modification time the same? If it is, you don't need to regenerate the spike code. Fantastic, it's all good. If it's out of date, once again, you're gonna have to make it all over again. Next, you check the size of your source code. 
Uh, if your file system's granularity on the modification time is too big, you can modify the source code and save it without it picking up a change in the modification time and this would fail. We've actually had this happen on our unit tests in Python. So you actually, we, had to, we added this in Python 3.3 to get rid of some flakiness that we were coming across. So this actually does happen. That's Windows fat as only two second rest Yeah, it, it's really um, nasty. So if the bytecode has the right magic number, has the right modification time, and has the right size for the source code, you then get to actually load the data. Uh, basically, you just take from byte 12 on, and you basically unmarshal it because uh, it's just a code object. Uh, if it failed, well, you're going to have to get out the source code. Right? So if you're lucky, you've got it all, code object, all good to go. If you're not so lucky, you've got to deal with the source and rebuild your bytecode. How does that work? Well, you read your source code as bytes. You don't, try, you don't have to worry about the encoding. Uh, that'll be taken care of for you by the compile function that's built in, right? Passing the bytes of the source, the location of where the source is, uh, that you're going to want it built for execution, not eval or as AST. And you don't want to inherit your namespace because you're doing this all nice and clean. Right? So this will get you a code object that you weren't able to get with your bytecode like before because you failed something. All right? Uh, now you got to build your bytecode, right? So first, you got your magic number. That's easy. Uh, you then add on the modification time for your source code, which you had from before. Uh, you tack on the size of the source code itself, and then you do a mars you use Marshall to dump the code object from the source uh, into bytes, and then write that out to disk. Uh, I should say, while I've been at the conference, both this part, all this, and the checks to get the code object, I'm working to refactor out into methods. So you guys should hopefully in Python 3.4 never see this and have to worry about this. You'll have nice methods to call, uh, but I'm not there yet. Anyway, this is how you make a new .pyc file. So with all that, this is how you get your code object that you're going to need to make your module. Sure. Um, both when you're loading the bytecode and the source, you're actually using the same function? Or is it a typo? Yeah, no, same function. So yeah, that function has to know how to differ between the bytecode and the source file. Yeah, so technically the way all this works is there's a get, um, there's a get code method that just knows what it has to do. So yeah, you've got it, the, the, the function's a good size. It's, all, it's, it's generic to the point of get me a code object. It's up to the loader to figure out how to get you that code object. And in the case of source code, it's bytecode or source code depending on what works. OK. So now we got our code object. Let's make ourselves a module. What does that take? Well, remember we already have the module object. So now we got to set the file, which is always the source pass to the source code now. Uh, we need to set the under under cache attribute, which is where the bytecode would be. Uh, and then with all that, uh, we'd see if uh, calling the loader, asking it, is this a package? Uh, if it is, uh, if it's not, let's just go with the not because it's simpler. Uh, we, set, we have to set under under package, right? And under package is going to be our name minus the right, everything past the rightmost dot, right? So if you're foo.bar.baz and you're not a package, so you're just a submodule, your package is foo.bar. Uh, let's say you are a package. All right, so what does that mean? Well, that means you're already your name of yourself, because if you're a package, you're your own name of your own package. And then you need to set under under path, which is where you're going to look for submodules. So this is just, in the simple case, just a list uh, with a single entry of just the directory name of the location of your source code. Nothing fancy. Uh, so we've got file set, we've got package set, we've got path set if needed. Uh, loader is going to be self because we're in the loader. And then here's the magic. This is where all the pixie dust is. Uh, take your code object and you execute it with the under under dict of your module as the global namespace of the code object. That's how you make a module. It sounds kind of simple and because it is. I mean, literally, if you think about it, when you, ex when you import a module, right, it's just executing code as it goes down. That's literally all this is doing, except instead of having it all put in the global namespace, 
you're just sticking it under under dict because those are going to end up as attributes on the module itself. And then when you're done with that, you're going to return your module. And that was all how you load a module. Did anyone have any questions? No? Okay. So, all the magic has happened. We've loaded a module. Now we have a module. Now we've got little, little, little details to deal with. All right? Remember the from list at the beginning? You know, if you go from foo import bar and bars in that from list, if you do just do import foo, there is no from list. All right? So, is there a from list? Yes or no? Uh, Let's say there is, all right? Uh, sorry, there's not. Uh, if there's not, you have to care about what index was, right? Zero means uh, you are right where you want to be. Uh, anything else meant you had a relative import. Uh, because of the way uh, imports work, uh, if you are at index zero, uh, you were right where you were. So what you need to do is you're going to want to return um, the very, 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 very top package of what you were wanting, right? So let's say you import foo.bar. What you want to end up returning is foo. Because when you go foo.bar in your code, it won't work if you return bar, right? Foo won't be defined. It won't exist. So if you just said import foo.bar, you want to return foo so that when you go foo.bar, you'll actually get foo, read the attribute bar, which is the module, and you'll get to use that. Uh, if you're not at the top level, uh, you have to care about whether or not name was defined. Uh, because if name was not defined, you do um, full name to the first dot. Because like if you do import, as we said, import dot dot spam from dot, from dot dot spam import uh, flying circus, uh, you want to return spam. Because once again, you specified spam as the name of the thing you want to work with. If you had said from dot dot spam dot bacon import flying circus, you still want spam because once again, the way you import stuff, it's going to be spam and then dot bacon. And I really hate from list, if you can't tell. Um, so that's basically how you deal with all that crud. If you have specif um, if you did specify name, then you just use that directly to figure out what module to return. Uh, let's say you did define from list, in which case you made me a very unhappy person for a very long time. Um, you check to see if you were working in a package, right? Did you define under under path? And if that's true, you need to see if you define an asterisk. And if I hope to God you guys are not using from something import star a lot, because you also made my life difficult for no good reason for a long time. Um, but if you did, what we do is basically, skipping some details, um, you grab uh, under under all and take your from list, re re remove the asterisk and just extend it with under under all. This is why this is kind of important to define so that you know exactly what's going to get returned. Uh, regardless of whether you did or did not define it, uh, you now have to iterate through your from list. All right? so, First thing in your from list, you're going to check to see if it already exists, right? So like if you're importing a class or a function, like from OS import uh, stat, stat's a function already in the OS module, you don't have to do anything special. It's already there, don't worry about it, keep on going. If it doesn't exist, more or less, what you end up doing is you end up importing it again. So this is a recursive call. So you go, okay, you're looking for this attribute on this module. I don't have it. I'm going to assume it's a submodule on this package. So I'm going to take that name, attach it to my name or under a package, because remember it's equivalent because we're in a package, and just import it so that it gets attached on as an attribute. Keep doing this over and over and over for every single entry in from list. Uh, once that's all done, you then are finished and you finally have your magical module. That is import. Uh, as I said, the shorter bit in the beginning is the official definition. Everything else is the magic to make it all happen the way you want it to. Uh, just to give you a rough idea, that is what it takes to deal with from list. And as you notice, from list is almost as complicated as import. Uh, as I said, I hate this. Uh, but things got to work the way they got to work. Uh, maybe I'll clean it up someday, we'll see. But 
that is everything. So syntax, figuring out what you want to import, import itself from list. Uh, how to find something off of sys.path or a package if you're working with a file system. Uh, how to import and how to load source code or bytecode and actually regenerate it if necessary. And that is everything. That is what it takes to import Python source code from beginning to end. And that's it. Any questions? Yes? What's the difference between from tool import last week? Well, technically nothing. It's just a syntactic shortcut to make names shorter. That's really it. I mean, otherwise, it's just lots of little tricks to make sure that the bytecode has the right module to work with to set names. Because if you look at the bytecode underneath, it's basically going, all right, I'm going to import this, and then I'm going to save it as a, uh, in, the names, in the global namespace, or I'm going to save it as an attribute or something. So it's all just to make it all just on the execution stack the right way, and then just use some bytecode to stick it somewhere. But technically, there's really lo no difference other than getting back the right module from the function. Yeah. Okay. Which was your motivation to attack this monster? <laughs> uh, I'm a masochist. Um, so this all started back. Oh God, when did this start? 2006. It literally took me five, over five years to do, off and on. Uh, basically, what I was trying to do was I was trying to secure uh, the Python interpreter, basically sandbox it so that you could securely execute untrusted code. And one of the things you have to do is you have to make sure you don't get to certain magical stuff. Like you can't use C extension code because C extension code could do whatever the heck it wants because it's C code. Uh, certain stuff off of sys you don't want exposed. You don't want people changing sys.path because now suddenly they can import other code that you don't want. Uh, so basically, the C code was big and complicated, and I didn't want to work with it. So I said, forget it. I'm going to rewrite it. And the basic simple stuff where you don't have to worry about every single edge case of the uh, import wasn't too ridiculous. But the deal is, is you guys, general of the Python community, not necessarily all of you, uh, like to really abuse import in very odd, strange ways. And it took a long time to work out all the little details of what was and was not okay to change based on how people did stuff. Uh, but that was the original motivation. Uh, I was actually trying to get Python into Firefox. Uh, but Brandon Dyke said no. So, sorry. Uh, but that, that was the original motivation. And at that point, it was just um, when that fell through and that didn't come, become my PhD thesis, I said, okay, screw that. You know what? I'm going to finish it because I want. Uh, people like Iron Python and Jython and PyPy to not have to re-implement this, right? There's nothing special about this. It's universal. Why not get it written in pure Python and then every single VM can use it as their implementation? So with Python 3.3, any of the, all the VMs will have the exact same implementation. There won't be any differences or anything like that. It's all going to be the same. So that became the final motivation. And honestly, I don't like C code. It's okay, but I'd much rather write in Python. So what's this done? It's a lot easier to do stuff like the namespace packages would not have happened if this hadn't happened because no one wanted to touch the C code. But with this, it was a l they did it in a weekend to implement namespace packages. It was a lot easier to work with. How much of this is executed when you reload the module? Uh, when you reload? Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. Because you have the module object, technically, uh, this part load because you already have the because um, it's already loaded so it'll be in system modules you already have the full name so there's no calculation there's no searching for it the loader's already defined on under under loader so all you really have to do is just call it again and then that'll just re-execute all this anybody else apologies for any headaches windows we have given you uh, uh, <laughs> Oh, well, as much testing as Python gets on Windows. I mean, as I said, it's the default implementation of import, and it has been since. Yeah, as of Thursday, I'm just trying to remember when it landed. It landed earlier this year. Uh, yeah, so 
at least since early this year, it's been the default. So all the build bots on Windows have been using this. Uh, three three's been out. I have not gotten any real complaints from anyone yet. Um, it's actually been surprisingly stable. People have been pretty good uh, about testing Python three three. So a lot of the little details got worked out. But honestly, there's nothing here that's specific to any OS because you just because it's pure Python, right? I get to. I, I it's easy to write little snippets of. Uh, functions to go, okay, this is how join works. This is how you do a stack call. It's just, it's all abstracted away. So Windows is not at all a problem. I mean, the only issue that was is, is um, case sensitivity, but you just have to deal with that once and just realize that you got to either uppercase or lowercase based on um, Python case okay. But that's also Mac's fault, so. No ill will towards Windows on my end for this. Anyone else? Ah, crap. We go to the prompt list and do it all over again for each So yeah, you have to go through and if you do from something import stuff and stuff isn't already on the module, you're gonna have to call import on those guys. But you don't have to redo it for the for the parent at all. That's a one time thing. All you do in the prompt list is you take that list, you iterate down it, you get set adder of each thing in the prompt list from the module. Yeah, I mean, sys.modules modules make sure you don't re you don't repeat yourself, you don't re waste all that time. Um, I should mention another thing in three three, um, the finders now cache directory locations, which as long as you're not generating source code on the fly is great because it means you're not constantly statting individual files. You just stat the directory, and then you instantly know whether or not anything changed. And so it's um, faster than Python three two, ironically enough, using this as the implementation in pure Python. Uh, if you use NFS. Uh, someone said they were getting between five and nine times faster uh, Python imports on this because because there's a lot less stat calls, which are horrible on NFS. So, if you if you have any funky OSs uh, that have bad stat call times, uh, you might want to look at this because we cache that stuff now. Anybody else? I mean, told that is it. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>